So, um, thank you for joining us, everybody. This is the Sober Saturday um, panel, week three. We're joined today uh, by Claire Pooley, um, author of the Sober Diaries on the Authenticity Project. So, hi, Claire. Hi, hello, everybody. And hi. by the lovely hi. Julia Carson, who is the author of Sober Positive. Hi, Julia. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, Julia. And the usual pieces as well. We are missing Mandy today, but she will be back with us next week. Um, Kate is quite happy to take questions in Mandy's uh, absence. And obviously she's half of the Love Supper crew anyway. So um, it's lovely to have you all here on this beautiful sunny day. We are talking today about cravings. So if you don't know me, I'm Alex and I'm one half of the Sober Experiment. Um, I will go around and pass around and we'll all get a chance to speak. And then we'll come to our lovely guests. Um, but I just want to start by saying, I don't know about anybody else, but this hot weather, it can be a trigger, it can be a trigger, because um, especially if you're quite newly sober, you might want to go out in the garden and crack open that beer or that peck. And um, if you are somebody who isn't triggered by non-alcoholic alternatives, my tip here would be, to, well, I've got two little tips for this. One would be, if you're not triggered and you, you want an adult kind of drink, have that. And obviously the flip side of that is if you aren't, if you um, don't want to have one of them, don't. There's other alternatives, nice cold drinks. Once you've actually opened the drink and you've got it in your hand, that can just take away the urge and the craving straight away anyway. And my other one would be, don't romanticise, just try to play it forwards, play the whole event forwards. So that's uh, it from me for just a minute. And I'm going to pass to my other half of the Silver Experiment. Hello, Lisa, how are you? Hi, Alex. Thank you. She forgot me last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's very nice for you to remember me. <laughs> I've just been thinking about what you've said about like fantasizing about it. And we put a post on earlier on our Instagram. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it's a cracking picture of Alex in in the old days. <laughs> um, so yeah, you'll have to check that out. But I think so many people have commented and on that because it's so relatable isn't it we look back at drinking and really fantasize about what a good time we had but if you really think about it it, it didn't always end like that which that for sure it's dead funny if you haven't seen it so go and have a look <laughs> yeah Lisa loves it <laughs> yeah I think uh, for me cravings they can feel a bit like a compulsion can't they when they come sometimes and I think when that craving hits I personally believe the best thing to do is have a really, really honest conversation with yourself. Like, ask yourself, why? What's going on here? Why am I really, really wanting this drink? What's it going to do for me? Like Alex said, play it forward. How's it going to make this situation right now better? I think if you can just take like five minutes or so to check in with yourself, it can be, it, it can be the difference between the decision that makes you feel amazing tomorrow or oh, it's going to make you feel real crap tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think, um, I say it a lot like I'm having a word with myself, but, yeah, have a word with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my top tip, and I'm going to go over to Dave. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, for me, cravings, I mean, I remember this time last year, I was uh, four months sober, and when the hot weather come out, I, I immediately associated it with the pub garden and sitting there for the afternoon and stuff like that. And I remember at one point the cravings got quite bad for me and I just had to get up and, and sort of check in with myself that it, it's like a school bully, you know, it's going to push and push and push until I give in. Uh, but what I tried to remind myself was that I'm in control of my thoughts. So by diverting my thoughts into something else, they went away and once I was in charge of that it made me feel a lot more in control uh, it's almost like a voice that tries to make it justifiable for you to drink you know and, and just remember that you are in charge uh, uh, ourselves. you broke up That's a bit it. sorry uh, I'm going to pass to the lovely Kate um, yeah, triggers and cravings. Hello, all right. Yeah, I mean, I hear you about the hot weather was definitely 
tricky the first time round because I think I stopped drinking in the summer, so a few years back. So and 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 it sort of hit me through the winter. I was kind of okay, and by the summer I was like, oh my god, I'm still like, why is my patio triggering me? And it's quite common that sort of hot weather. Um, so yeah, and I hear you about that sort of playing it forward and having a word with yourself as well, and alcohol-free alternatives if they're not triggering. Um, and what I did is I looked on this website, um, and maybe we can link it. Um, it's a government website in the States for alcohol um, use and misuse. And it okay. says, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it says, remind, so that sort of trigger being external things, people, places, events, that cause an uncomfortable reaction emotionally, physically with us. And we're wanting to change it. We're wanting to go, oh, I don't like this. I want to change it. So it's finding different alternatives, I think, because triggers are always going to come. And what they suggest is remind yourself of your reasons for making a change. So keep it somewhere visible. Like I had a list on my fridge of your whys. So like why, why am I doing this? Why should I play it forward? Because I don't want to feel shit. Because I'm going to have ruined sleep. Because I'm going to hate myself. That, that kind of thing. Uh, talk it through someone uh, a trusted friend so you know get hop on a hop on a group um or yeah talk to talk to a sober buddy distract yourself this is something that i do a lot actually whenever so my my cravings my triggers don't so much go to alcohol at the moment but and this is a slight i'm diverting slightly i'm sort of finding food a bit funny with lockdown so i'm sort of applying this to food so go and distract myself, go and move, physically move, ride it out. That's a big thing, isn't it, in the early days, you just ride it out. And if you just wait, it passes. Like, who knew? Nobody told me that. I was like, I thought, like, day, oh, I'm just going to have to give into it because it's just going to get stronger and stronger. I didn't know that those cravings or those urges would pass. Um, and leave the high-risk situation. And we're not in that so much about leaving the party so some of those will go but i think even just like our cravings and triggers coming up from being wanting a bit of space maybe with our families that's something i've taught for myself <laughs> just like being able to do that hour of exercise and get out somewhere or even like go out in the garden i feel really lucky i've got a garden and i can do that which is physically sort of move so yeah that's what i've been thinking about today Oh, and I'm going to pass to Simon. Oh, thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. So I think you guys have covered a lot of the tips and tactics I would use to deal with cravings. I don't get huge amounts of cravings these days, but definitely a sunny day or I've got this thing about the old style London pubs. If I walk past those and the lights are all on inside, there's just this moment where I have a thought about maybe just going inside and it, and it passes. But I guess one tactic that I use with some of the people I coach with and, and something that worked for me was if you can pause when you feel that thought, that craving come to mind, actually take a moment to map out the journey from having a thought through to the drink hitting your lips. And I was talking to someone about it this morning, actually, and we, we put it, and I know Dave loves a really corny analogy or a, cli <laughs> or a cliche or whatever. I, I put it in the, in the context of a subway train, an underground train, and how we have thousands of thoughts every day. They're like empty trains. There they come, they go, they're transient thoughts. Yet one about alcohol comes along into the, into the station, and this train is bright red, it's got lights on it, and we can get on that train. Now, the point is we don't have to go to the final destination. We can, if we map out everything from, I've had a thought, right now I've got to put my shoes on and put my coat on and go out the front door and get in the car, drive to the shop, choose the wine, pay for the wine, assuming it's wine or vodka, or whatever. There's probably 30 steps in the whole process, maybe more. And if you actually write all these steps out, that each one of those is like a station on that journey and you have a choice you've got the power of choice in this to get off at any one of those stations at any one of those steps and when you think about that I've had people text me and they're like 
I got in the car, but I haven't gone off the drive. And now I texted you instead, Simon, and they go, you know, I'm going back inside right now. So just knowing that we've got a choice any step of the way and actually mapping out your your uh, your Jubilee line, your underground line, to from thought through to final destination of taking a drink, I think can be quite a, a powerful tactic. And it's one of those things when you know it, you kind of can't unlearn it. You sort of remember it when you're on that journey from getting on the, the the thought train through to uh, final destination i guess so that would, who's who's left william hasn't um shared his cravings comments so over to william i've only just managed to get him back in he disappeared yeah. oh did he <laughs> <What's going on>? <laughs> <laughs> um so can you hear me all right yeah yeah okay so, I mean, for me, I think the thing with cravings is um, the big thing is playing it forwards. Um, but I think it's not just a case of playing it forwards to the following day. Um, I think it's worth playing it forwards a lot sooner than that because I think there's, there's one of those sort of platitudes, which is one of my bed, pub beds, which is drinking and following happiness tomorrow. Um, and I think it's really worth a bit of that because it's not really borrowing happiness from tomorrow because a lot of the time people aren't happy when they're drinking anyway. What they may get from the first couple of drinks is a sort of a slight buzz as they anaesthetise some kind of anxiety, most of which is caused by the previous drinking. But after a few bit, bit a few drinks, people tend to get sort of quite argumentative <coughs> and it's not particularly um, it's not particularly pleasant. If you watch people, and, and this is why I think it's useful, I know a lot of people when they stop drinking, they try and keep away from other drinkers, but I find it hugely encouraging. Because I think if you go on nights out, um, you see people when they have had the first couple of drinks, yes, they do pick up a bit and they're a bit more chatty, but after an hour or so, they kind of come down again. Um, and a lot of the time, not only are they no happier than you are, but they generally get a bit argumentative or angsty and they're never quite relaxed anyway. So we have this fantasy that all night's really good fun when you're drinking, but, but I don't think it is. You can watch people most of the time after, say, after a couple of drinks, they kind of they certainly don't seem to be any happier than those who aren't drinking, um, and most of the time a lot less happy. Um, and you'll have to forgive me, I've lost count of <laughs> who we're actually talking to, so I'm not sure who's up next. We're over to our guests now, actually, William. So. Um... Can I start with you, Claire? Is that all right? Mm, yes, sure. Okay, so what, what's your take on this? Any tips or thoughts on cravings? Um, yeah, I mean, I used, I found it really helpful to think of cravings as like little toddlers. And I don't know if, if everybody has had to deal with a toddler at some stage, but you know when a toddler has a tantrum, you know, that's how I saw my cravings. It was a toddler tantrum. And, um, and often the, the best way to deal with a toddler tantrum is, is to distract them. So, you know, your toddler's having a tantrum because they want to watch Peppa Pig. And, you know, the way I would deal with that is to sort of say, oh, look, you know, so have you seen, um, you know, this colouring book or, or would you like a you know, chocolate bar or whatever it is? And, and I, I dealt with cravings very much the same way. So, my, you know, the minute I, I had a craving, I would try and find something else to do to take my mind off it. So I would go out for a walk with the dog or I would clean the bathroom or I would read a book or, you know, anything that, that stopped me thinking about it. Um, and the other thing that, that you learn about toddler tantrums is often you think they're having a tantrum about one thing, but it's really something else. So, you know, they think that they want to watch Peppa Pig and that's why they're really upset. And actually the reason, the real reason they're upset is because they're hungry or they're tired or, you know, they uh, there's something going on in their life that, you know, they've had an argument with, their, with one of their and the same is true with cravings. You think you want a glass of wine. Actually, often you're just anxious about something or you're tired or, you know, you're hungry. And there's, there's some other reason why you want that drink. So it's often worth just sitting back and thinking, it's really, it's not really about the drink, it's about something else. Um, and the the tantrum is they go away and so do cravings so you know if you just sit through it for five minutes it will feel better 
Um, and it's almost worth looking at your watch or setting an egg timer because sometimes it feels like it's going on for ages and actually it's really not that long. It will get better. So, so those are my, my three sort of toddler training tips. Um, you know, the first one being, uh, um, second one, you know, think about why, why you're having the craving. And then the third one, just remembering it will go away. Well, thank you, Claire. That's really useful and practical tips there. Thank you. And hi, Julia. Um, what what's hi. your take on this? I think for me, look, I think, I think while people have been talking, I've been thinking back to my early days and what really worked well for me and what, what I kind of almost had to do sometimes was think, trying to think my way out of the craving or talk my way out of the craving didn't work. And what I had to do was completely shift my energy and do something physical. So a lot of the time for me, that was running back in my early days. There were times when it was like literally the only thing I could do to kind of shift the, the craving feeling and the, um, the that kind of energy that I was stuck in was to go out for a run and to just run it out. And obviously that's not something that everybody's going to be able to do at the moment, but I would imagine anybody who can dial into this call has got a device. And so, you know, there's videos you can stream into, there's, there's downloads, there's ways to move your body and, and to exercise. And um, one thing that I do when I still do, and not, not so much for alcohol cravings, because I don't really get that as such anymore, but I do obviously get moments of, ah, as everyone does at the moment. And um, one of my yoga teachers does a thing where we um, literally, we close our eyes, we all stand on our individual yoga mat, and we just dance like crazy with our eyes closed for the length of kind of one song and just like really go for it, really move your body in like whatever way you want, whatever, however feels good to you. And that kind of shakes out a lot of the energy. And that, again, is something that I will quite often do if I'm kind of faced with something that, if I, if I was in my early days, I would probably call it a craving. But because I've broken that association now over time with the alcohol, I just, I can kind of put it down more to anxiety or to frustration with something. Or, um, you know, I can kind of, I'm not attributing it to craving a drink, but it's still this kind of, this unhelpful energy that I need to shift and I need to get out of. And, and movement is definitely my top tip for that. I love that, Julia, the idea of dancing. I hope you don't get the craving in the middle of, like, some work. <laughs> I, do, I do it in the bathroom. <laughs> I do it in the bathroom a lot like more. just walking down the yeah, street. No, it, it is a really, really good, um, really good idea, though. Somebody on the Facebook has just said, if you keep seeing me looking down, I'm kind of trying to check our Facebook as well, um, that they've said they don't get cravings anymore. It's different emotions and feelings that they're getting and finding that quite difficult difficult they're only five and a half months is that normal does anybody want to answer that i'll jump in on that I, one i will go into you then Simon, if nobody <laughs> i could see you looking <laughs> i could see you looking my way i just wanted to say i've julia's point around the yoga and the dancing is I, it's so true i think we often forget the power of music I put a playlist on my Spotify and I really took my time over it to have a list of songs that I absolutely can't help singing along to. And I think we've all got them, but you've got to be kind of, you've got to be real tough on yourself and make sure you absolutely can't resist. And if you've got that list, it can be quite a, quite a tool to have in terms of those moments where you, you know, you put that list on and if you just can't resist it, then I, Gloria by, I think it's Laura Branigan, isn't it? I just can't help singing to it. You know? <laughs> it's cheesy as hell, but I just can't help singing to that song, you know, whatever happens. So uh, in terms of uncomfortable emotions and thoughts, my big sort of tip with that would be to absolutely not try and suppress them. Don't try and push them away. I talked before about visualising a big elephant that come into the room or a big hippopotamus that just will not leave. You know, sitting with your eyes closed, visualising it, giving it a name, looking it in the eye and just saying, I'm not going to play with you today. I'm not going for a ride and just doing that visualisation until it gets bored and walks out of the room. That's the short version. There's a video on my YouTube channel about it. But you can weaken the power of it essentially by not trying to push the elephant out of the room and just just talking to it and looking it in the eye. So that, yeah, that's that's a good way. And they, I've got a bunch of those things for uncomfortable thoughts and feelings on, on my YouTube channel. Has anyone else got one? Oh, who else wants I, I was just going to add to what you, you said, Simon. So, sorry, I just wanted to ask one thing before you move on. What what do you not think as well? Just sometimes you just have to give yourself a bit of a break, don't you? Just, you know, it, 
we're human. These things don't go away in reality. They don't, you know, they get easier, but there are times you be doing something completely unrelated and all of a sudden, wham, it's there. And you're thinking, whoa, where did that come from? And that gets easier and less and less as you go on. But sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I'm human. Uh, it's not going to go away. I'm just going to take a break from whatever it is. That's true. See, I find that quite hard because I know, you know, I read things and I listen to meditations about loving kindness and treat yourself gently. And it all makes complete sense. But I actually found that really hard because I kind of have this sort of perfectionist streak and I feel like I've, you know, I'm never good enough sort of thing. So, and I, you know, a lot of people get overwhelmed by those thoughts. And in, in I totally agree that that you absolutely should do that. But when it's over, when a thought's overwhelming you, it can be quite hard even to jump onto a tactic like mine or, or any of the tactics because you just feel like you want to lay on the floor or take a drink and the world's caving in on you. But yeah, we should cut ourselves some slack and it can be easy to forget to do that. I just forgot to mention it there, you know, and I, I don't do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to move to Dave because you were going to say something and I can see that there's one of our audience wants to ask something as well, so I'll come to you in a second, Money. Well, I was just going to mention that we can't get good old uh, willpower as well because since I've uh, given up drinking, I had the old infamous sugar monster come along and bite me on the arse several times, you know, but i still got that now and there's times now that on a Monday morning I look down and I'm like, especially now that I'm eating like a pig, <laughs> oh, putting a bit of weight in that and there's a big fat bit of cake in the cake tin I think right I'm going to have that and sometimes <laughs> I have to say actually if uh, you're worried about a bit of weight going on you really don't want that bit of cake and I sort of relate to a similar thing that sometimes you just have to have the willpower to, to say no as well you know just say look that's not serving me any purpose whatsoever hearing that nagging voice in your head going, go and have the cake, go and have the cake. Mm. Nah. Yeah. You know, sometimes willpower has to play as well. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Kate, to you, sorry? Yeah, I was just going to, just sort of assimilating everything that people are talking about. Uh -huh. I'll change the screen name to yours if you want to. Oh, oh. Can you mute? Yeah, done it. Okay. Yeah, so, and this whole thing about, you know, what can we access in the moment? And part of that is like we talked about it last week, is some things are just kind of emergency dial downs, and some things are like sort of proactive experiments to see what works, right? Because in, in the sort of the, the cravings, is that the behavior thing is that you've got a cue, then you've got the action that you do, and then you've got a reward, which is the kind of dopamine or the serotonin or the GABA which are the neurotransmitters and what they're trying to do is regulate you so often something might happen up the craving or you know what we see our brains go to alcohol but like we said before it's an uncomfortable emotion or physical sensation so what also what we're looking out for is biochemical matches so things that light you up so like the dancing in the kitchen not, you know, because I felt that again, like that before, you know, when I stopped drinking, there's a lot of us relate to that sort of inner perfectionist and think, oh God, I'm supposed to be doing yoga, I'm supposed to be doing this, I'm supposed to be journaling when I've got a trigger. You might hate journaling, that might be even more triggering for you. So actually what you're looking for is bright spots and what, what you love. And I think once I realised that and I gave myself permission to... I don't know, like I do things like gold stars and lipsticks. Um, I've done um, something the other day, like we just put Madonna on in the kitchen and danced around to it, or do makeup, or just, you know, think back to the things that you love. What kind of movement do you love? Do you like drawing? Do you just want to sit and watch Netflix? You're allowed to. But it's like, don't drink and then do anything else. And then, Reflect on it. How did it make me feel? Like I loved it. I hated it. But I don't do that again. You know, so gradually, gradually adding to that sort of toolkit, you know, that we talk about. Yeah, it's a good point. Can I just go to a question, Monique? Do you still want your question? Give me a wave. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Am I on mute? Can you hear me? You're unmuted, yeah. Okay. First of all, I'm so excited to be here. I follow all you guys on Instagram, and it's just very exciting. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I used to do, I'm two years sober in March, so um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, 
Um, one of the things that I used, to, I, I still do every once in a while. Every once in a while, there's that thought that, well, maybe I could just have one, right? Or you have a thought about how much fun you used to have when you drank. I am, I'm a person that takes a lot of pictures, a ton of pictures, and they're on my phone. And they're all backed up to a cloud source, right? Usually it's Google Photos or something like that. And a lot of times what I'll do when those cravings hit is I will, um, where those thoughts start coming, is I'll literally go into my phone and I'll do a search on drink. And what will happen is it'll return all these pictures that I took when I was drinking with my friends. And there's nothing like looking at those photos. And a lot of times you look really happy in those photos, but you can see how puffy your face is or how you look, your eyes don't look as bright as they did. And a lot of times it'll trigger a memory and I'll think, yeah, we looked really happy in that picture, but I remember by two o'clock in the afternoon, I went home and had to sleep it off, right? And that was the rest of the day. Or I think about the hangover that came up, that came on either later that night or the next day. And it brings me right back to that moment and it makes it so much more um, real and concrete in my mind when I try to play it forward because there's actual documented evidence of it. So that's something that has helped me to get through some of those thoughts, especially in the early days. I don't have them as much anymore, but when I did in the early days, that really helped. I think that's really good to know, Monique. And, mm. to, and for people that might be watching that are in the early days, a lot of us have said about the early days, so it seems that we're all not really... Because I've got to be honest, I don't really crave an alcoholic drink anymore. Um so I think it, that's a good thing for people to hear that, you know, it, it does stop. William, mm. you're, you're good with cravings and how long they last and the science things behind it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you do some science? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the cravings, what you need to bear in mind is there's various things that can kick you off when you're drinking. The physical withdrawal is one of them. Um, and obviously that's, so alcohol is a depressant, so when you drink it, your body tries to counter it by increasing the stimulants, so when the alcohol wears off, you're left over stimulated, so that's that anxious kind of nervous feeling you get. Um, that usually only lasts about two to three days, but if you're only two to three days from your last drink, there will be that um, physical element to it. Um, but I think the, the actual science behind the actual craving itself is just a conscious thought process, there's not an awful lot to it. Um, and essentially what it is, it's just fantasizing about having a drink. And that goes back, I think, to playing it forwards. Because we as human beings, um, one of the key triggers in our life, the thing that pushes us on to drive and to reach for better things, is we have two tendencies. One is to be very critical of what we have. And the other thing is to fantasize about what we don't have. And those two things together are what drives us on to keep taking that next step. And you quite often hear people saying things like, oh, I'm never happy. And, you know, as soon as I get something, I want the next thing. But for me, that's just ambition. That's just how we get through our lives. You know, you get something and then you want the next thing. And that drives you to keep moving on. But the problem is where it's counterproductive with addiction is when we're drinking, we have it and we're very critical of it and we hate it, which is why a lot of people, when they're drinking, they want to stop. But the problem is when you do stop, you start fantasizing about it. And again, that's why playing it forward, being realistic about it, I think is so important. Um, because the thing that pulls us back in is a fantasy. It is not real. It's like a trap where the cheese in the trap is just an illusion. Because when you walk back into it, you're not going into that idealized fantasy that dragged you in in the first place. You're going back to the reality, which is always quite grim. Um, and I think that's the key. And when you're playing it forwards as well, don't just think about the next day, but think about what will actually happen when you take that drink. Because we tend to sit there and think, you know, like the weather's nice at the moment, so you sit in the garden and you have a drink and everything's perfect. Of course it isn't. You're still going to have the house to tidy, the dinner to make, the kids screaming, whatever is causing you problems anyway. But then you've got all the guilt and the worry about the fact that you started drinking again. Um, and then you've got to look forward to a sleepless night and even worse day the next day. So... I think that's the key with it. Just remember that cravings are a, a thought process and you can control it, which is why things like running and distractions do work very well. You can also, as Dave said, you can just grit your teeth and get on with it. Um, and sometimes that's all you can do. But it does help, I think, to remember that it is a conscious thought process. Um, and it is based on a fantasy. It's based on you fantasizing about what it would be like to have a drink. 
thanks for that, Lillian. I'm going to come back to you in a second, Claire and Julia, but before we do, uh, Rachel, I've just unmuted you from Welford Wellbeing. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Rachel knows quite a few Hello. of us in here. Um, and <laughs> I can see lots of people. Oh. Maybe you know everybody. Um, you've, you've offered to share a very practical tip on how people can get past cravings with a breathing technique. Would you mind? Yeah, look, it's a, a technique. You can use it for anxiety as well. And I think a lot of people, it was definitely my experience anyway. I gave up thinking because of my mental health, basically. Like, I, I wanted to get back to normal after my breakdown and I started drinking and I was like whoa hang on <laughs> this this is actually making my mental health worse so that's kind of why I, I stopped drinking personally and um yeah there's this really easy technique that you can use that's really easy to remember you can do it anywhere and it not only calms like um your nervous system but it acts as a pattern interrupt as well so for a lot of the things around cravings and um you know it's it's I forget the other guy's name, sorry, I didn't know who was just saying about the, the cravings and the, the thought process behind it. William. It, William Porter. Sorry, thank you. So um, what William was saying about that, you know, it starts with a thought and basically your your thoughts and feelings are so interlinked and actually um, if you can create what we call pattern interrupt, you can break that pattern and then you can choose something different. But often when you don't have something to interrupt that pattern, so it's like a thought of, I want a drink or I'm going to eat that cake or whatever, I, I definitely resonate with what Dave said about the sugar monster coming <laughs> out. <laughs> My God, after I'd stopped drinking for about two or three months, I think, I was eating like family-sized bars of dairy milk every day. And I was like, this needs to stop. <laughs> Use this, but it doesn't just have to be for cravings or... Um, you know, you can use it as what we call pattern interrupts at any time that you feel um, that, you know, maybe your emotions are, are getting to a point where they're uncomfortable to sit with or they're uncontrollable. Because I think definitely looking back, I used to use alcohol as a suppressant for my emotions. So anytime, like I never miss drinking for fun at all. Like I still go out a lot and I know some people can't do that and it's a trigger for some people, but... I still go out, my friends are DJs and stuff, my whole life's been built around raves, so <laughs> I still go and I, and I have a great time, but when I miss a drink, it's when something bad's happened, so if I've had a bad day or I, I feel like I need a break from from whatever that uncomfortable feeling is, so um, you can use this for that as well. So um, it's called Harmony in Hand, it's super, super simple, you just hold the wrist and you can do it, doesn't matter which wrist, um, if you're left or right handed. Um, you just hold the wrist and you take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And then you just say a word of the opposite of how you're... So say if you're anxious, you could use the word calm. Or if you're, um, you know, sad, you could use the word happy. Or if you're, um, I don't know, you get the point. <laughs> um, so you can just pick whatever word you want of how you want to feel. And you say that word after. So deep breath in. Deep breath out, happy, calm, and then you hold the thumb and you do the same thing. Deep breath in, deep breath out, calm. Next finger, deep breath in, deep breath out, calm. Next finger, deep breath in, deep breath out, calm. Next one. Deep breath in, deep breath out, um, next one, deep breath in, deep breath out, um, and then you can just go back round, starting on the wrist, And you can say the word in your head. You don't have to say it out loud. And then you basically just keep going around until you feel different. 
And often that only takes like two or three times to go around. I used to use this all the time. I used to have panic attacks on public transport. And like living in London, I was on public tra- transport all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was joyous. Um, and this is one of the ones I used to use because people don't need really to do it anywhere. You don't need any special equipment. You just need to know how you want to feel and have your breath. And it works really effectively, super quick. I've taught it to loads of people. Um, and lots of people who are like, that's never going to work if I'm having a panic attack. And then they're like, message me being like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, um, yeah, I use that one a lot as well for like changing when I want to change how I want to feel and I'm not comfortable sitting with how I feel. It's like, you know, emotions only last six seconds. That's, you know, the chemical reaction of emotion lasts six seconds. So if you can work through those six seconds and get yourself then it then it's a mood after that or feeling which can be multiple emotions so then it's it's just about ch- changing that belief system around you know where you get your joy where you get your happiness like what feelings mean because they, they don't mean anything like they're just literally thoughts are the messengers of the mind and feelings are the messengers of the body and when it's an emotion it's a chemical reaction it happens um within half a second and only lasts for six seconds then it turns into a feeling and a feeling is the beliefs and our view of what that chemical reaction means so then it's like oh i feel sad for example i'm not allowed to feel sad because whatever reason and then you start to feel guilty or bad for feeling the way that you feel or whatever it might be right or angry or you know it's actually just being able to sit with whatever it is and realise that it doesn't mean you're good or bad. None of your feelings are good or bad. They're just telling you something that needs to be resolved within you. And then that gives you the power back as well to kind of look at, okay, well, what's the source of that feeling? Ah, it's actually, is it something present in the moment or is it something from the past that's being triggered? You know, and then we can unpick it. But anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. No, no, thank you, Rachel. That that goes back then, doesn't it, really, to what you were saying, Claire. I'm gonna I'm just gonna mute you back again now. Thanks for that, Rachel. Right. Um that goes back then, so back to you, Claire, about the toddler thing as well. So back in your in your book, you describe how emotion leads to mood. And you went your poor husband has ended up wearing food on one occasion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think one thing that is, is really worth pointing out about this peculiar time that we're living through is, you know, I think it's particularly tough if you're quitting at the moment because um, cravings and anxiety are really closely linked and they feel really similar. There's that sort of knotted feeling in your stomach, which is sort of, which which is, is very much, you know, the same, whether it's anxiety or cravings. So, you know, even if you feel really comfortable now about not drinking feeling the anxiety that we're all feeling at the moment um can bring back that sort of craving feeling um and also i think if you know for those of us who've been sober for a long time you know i find with anxiety at the moment i'm going back to all the techniques that i was using when i quit drinking in order to deal with the constant anxiety that we're all feeling so you know cleaning my house constantly and going out for walks with the dog and you know all the things that i did when you know, when I was when I first quit drinking, I'm I'm doing again now. So, you know, I, I think it's worth remembering that now is a particularly hard time. So so I think we all deserve to give ourselves a really big round of applause because just sometimes just getting through to the end of the day without going nuts is a real achievement. And uh, you know, don't worry if you're not doing anything else other than getting to the end of the day without picking up a drink. You know, that that is really, you know, a really big achievement right now. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to talk about really quickly, which um, if you've read my, my book, you'll, you'll know a lot, is the, the um, thought of the wine witch. Um, and, you know, wine was my thing. If, if beer was your thing, it might be a beer monster or whatever. But for me, it was the wine witch. And I, I found the, the idea of the wine witch really, really helpful because sometimes when you're dealing with those cravings and you've got all these thoughts going on in your head, it feels like you're battling with yourself. So, you know, you're saying, I don't want to drink. And then you're also saying, yes, you do want to drink and you deserve one and you're having a really hard time right now. So go and pour one right now. I say, no, I don't. And it, it, it feels like this constant battle going on inside your own mind. And that can make you feel like you're going slightly crazy. 
um, and you feel like you're fighting yourself, which is a really difficult thing to do. And, you know, what I did was I pictured that voice, that sort of addict voice as, uh, as the wine witch. And I saw myself killing the wine witch. And the only way to kill the wine witch was to deprive her of what she wanted. If you gave her a drink, she would get stronger. And if you took the drink away, she would get gradually weaker and weaker and weaker until she eventually died, which she did. And, um, you know, and I would visualize, you know, bashing the hell out of her. And every time you don't give into a craving, you're taking some of her power away. And if you can visualize your beer monster or your wine witch or whatever as something separate from you, then you can fight it. You're not fighting yourself. You're fighting something else. And I think that that for me is really, really helpful. You don't want to feel like you're fighting your own head. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it definitely does. And you're not, you know, people say that slightly differently. They say you are not your feelings, don't you? But it's mm-hmm. very true. You, you know, you you create your, not necessarily create, you can manage your feelings by acting in the opposite way that you want to act. You can manage mm-hmm. your feelings. Claire, can I just um, say something? In your first book, you talk about the fear of the cashiers, you know, and how they might be judging you. How relieved are you on a scale of one to ten that you're sober <laughs> right now and you can only go out for essentials? <laughs> no, do you know what? I, I, every day, still, I'm so glad, and particularly right now, because, you know, I went to my supermarket the other day and, um, and they were completely out of, um, you know, alcohol it was all gone and and even the alcohol free beer had gone which really pissed me off oh. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know I mean in the old days that I would have been you know I would have been horrified by that I would have spent so much time and energy fretting about filling up my covers I would have thrown out the pasta and the loo roll and all the really important <laughs> stuff and all of this you know the children's cereal to make room for more more wine and beer so, so you know and, and it, I would have felt constantly anxious about you know whether I had enough to keep me going and the other reason it is so good to be sober right now I think is that is you know you know when you're on holiday and you think okay well you know this is not normal life so you can actually start drinking at lunchtime and actually since we're on holiday yeah. maybe even 11 o'clock you know and and you sort of, you know, all the normal rules don't apply. I would have done the same thing in this pandemic. I would have thought, you know, of course the normal rules don't apply. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> of course I can start drinking earlier. Of course I can drink every day. Of course, you know. And there's so much chat I'm seeing on social media about, you know, people trying to work out what the pandemic rules are for drinking, you know, and whether it's okay to drink every day in a pandemic and whether it's okay to drink in the at lunchtime in a pandemic. And God, how exhausting. How yeah. exhausting is all of that? It really yeah. is. Um, we've got we've got somebody with the hand up in the audience, Justin. Um, hey, so hi, I'm sort of new today. Um I've never sort of joined um one of these. I've I've chat to Sober Dave. Um and uh, yeah we've had some Hey Dave, how you doing? Um, so I've got a, maybe a little bit of a long-winded story, but um, I just want to get your guys' take on this, um, if you don't mind. So I suppose growing up in my twenties, I've you know been drink um, ten pints. You know you go out, get smashed. Um, and then I sort of hit the age of well forty, um, and basically my wife had cancer. Um, I'd, you know. Basically, chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy, you know, the worst case, if you like. I've got three young children, I've got twins that are 11 and a seven year old. Um, and yeah, I, I lived opposite a pub. So, you know, that, that deep down, that, I'd say that's what sort of got me through it. Um, but I've just got a, do you want a question I want to chuck out. Um, my circle, when, when in need, I've really noticed that my friends, or I thought my friends, didn't step up. And my friends, so-called in the pub, you know, they're the ones I would talk to. And I came home and basically my, my daughter just said, Dad, what are you doing? Like, you know, and it just hit me in the face. So as of five months, I just haven't touched a drink ever since. Um, and it occurred to me that actually, that I wouldn't say it was an addiction, but it, I noticed addictive behaviours like what you guys were talking about earlier. You know, if it's eating, if it's, you know, looking for a holiday, looking for a car or these trains in my life, I only just realised, I got to the age of 14, just realised that actually, 
you know, I'm addicted to going to the pub or because I wanted to go there and have a laugh because my life felt really shit at the time. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, my wife has got better. She had a double mastectomy. We're, we're sort of living that life now. Um, but I, I feel like today, like we all talk, it's sunny out there. But my circle of friends have completely changed. And this is what I want to speak to you guys about. And in a way, it's sort of it's put me in a lonely place in the fact that, you know, my drinking mates, um, they're no longer there no more because I've realised that's bad for me, um, not good for my mental health. And also it's a bad um, circle to be in. You know, they didn't step up for me. So in a weird way, I've found that my life has turned, I guess, into a positive because I've, you know, hence doing things like this. Um, you know, before I'd be out in the garden having a barbecue of a load of beers with my so-called drinking friends. Um, but I guess it's made me feel more serious as a person um, and life has become very serious. However, I am struggling to have those sort of good laughs, I guess. So, you know, I used to associate having a beer or a drink with having a laugh. But my life feels quite serious now, and I wonder what everyone else does to, you know, break the mould, you know, have a laugh. What, what do people do? Hey. <clears throat> Hi, Justin. Yeah. I still haven't uh, forgotten about jumping out of that plane, by the way. Oh, just on that. Um, yeah. Um, me, I've got this on today. I've, I, uh, I saw that. Sorry, on the back. Yeah, of but going back to what you're saying, mate, we we've got um, a very similar story, haven't we? Because uh, my wife's had cancer, as you know, um, and I used to belong to a local club. Well, belong. I used to go to a local pub a lot, so I completely understand what you're saying there. But what I found with my friends were they weren't real friends; they were drinking companions. Yeah. And when I decided to give up drinking. Um, they they all left as well because they mm. I wasn't there to be one of the boys and whatever and I completely understand what you mean about um, being really lonely and nowhere to turn and whatever but you do forge a new life and there's a lot of guys on here that I didn't know before uh, when I was drinking and I, I went to an event in Dalston that I met Lee from Rock Sober Claire I met her quite a few guys were there and since okay. then, I've, I've got a, a fantastic array of different friends, sober friends. You know, I've created a whole new friend base. And what I've found with that, I met William. Oh, Dave, that, well. that's what inspired me. I remember, weirdly, I came across M, sorry, your, your partner, um, book, basically, um, because of her story. And then just coincidentally, I sort of realised that you were part of that. And then I always had in the back of mind, oh, I wonder if he gave up on the back of cancer stuff. I never ever spoke out about anything before, you know. I just sort of cracked on with everything. Um, and then off the back of all that, I've created well, me and my wife have created a charity called Wolo Foundation, mm. which I'm wearing randomly. Um, it stands for We Only Live Once. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's basically a charity that helps families through cancer because mm. uh, being you know the, the age we're at, you don't expect cancer to hit you. Um, and it affected everything from everyday life. So it's not about, um, you know, the big treats and things. It's about every day. It's about just helping, you know, your community, your friends. Um, because I have people who would step up to me who I've never met before, who I guess could relate because they've been through some sort of situation before. Um, and it really, really made a big difference to me. So I guess they're like my new friends in a way. I've become more sociable with people I've never even speak to before. Um, I guess I have more gratitude for you know life and you know. I'm everyone not that I know and... now, sorry mate. Everyone that sorry. I know now for this sober world, I find and Lee will admit to this. Lee down there rock sober and his brother okay. Sean. That everyone's incredibly humble. You know they're so grateful for their new life now. And I used to look at life like looking through this tiny little lens. And when I gave up, it just exploded like a Hubble telescope. You know, and you're so grateful. And for me, I, I've been a lot more present for them. You probably with your wife and that. Yeah. And when you suggested the other week about jumping out of a plane, before I would never even thought about it. But now I'm like open to, to so many different things now. You know, I'm yeah. going on an alcohol-free holiday. Where, you know, if it is still around. Yeah, the end of the year. And, I, I yeah, and, and, you know, your brilliant. life just expands. So I wouldn't worry about it. I'll, you know, you can meet yeah. new people and. Uh, follow social groups on Instagram like Sober and Social and join clubs. So like and what, what, what I'm scared of a little bit, and I'm sure you've been there, sorry guys, um, is I've joined lots of groups to help me through 
um, this cancer life, if you like. And it's really tough. You know, for every good story, there's 100 negative stories. Um, and, yeah, it scares me. So, you know, actually coming on this is the first time. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to do something for myself, really. So I've sort of known that maybe, I, you know, I did have those traits of alcoholic, if, if you want to call it. Um, it's a slippery slope, and I guess I realised that. And, I, you know, it's nice to see other people really? here. Yeah. And this is the start. Oh. This is the start, Justin. Is it Sarah Lisa? You go. You were going to we say like something. We're like together. We talk uh, about it. Yeah, and um, I'd like to get to Julia about this as well. So I just wanted to say to Justin, this is the beginning. You've said that. You know, coming on here and yeah. speaking to us and just kind of surrounding yourself, whether that be on your social media. You know, there'll be something that will come up and you'll think, "I'm going to go to that." I was very similar, and I lost all of my friends that I used to go out drinking with and um, Alex hadn't stopped when I first stopped so I, I kind of get that loneliness of thinking oh my god am I ever going to laugh again and I remember feeling like that but all I can say is I promise you you will and you will find people I think you've just got to put yourself out there sometimes and surround yourself with it on your social media until you feel ready to meet up with people and sorry, also Justin. sorry can i just quickly oh. say something on that sorry i know you're going to julia just really <laughs> quick justin first of all you know, well done on five months that's amazing and the inner strength you've clearly got to work through that with your wife is just you know, humbling but when i quit i actually joined a boot camp and i made a sober bucket list and all these things and i didn't actually realize it at the time but I actually, I made friends with people in a non-drinking environment, but they weren't non-drinking people. So don't feel, I mean, the advice that we're giving around the groups and things like that is great, but don't feel all your friends have to be sober because we were talking about this yesterday, funny enough, but you, you can find connection in places where alcohol is not center stage, you know, like in a boot camp, for example. My just a very quick piece of advice would be to just take a moment, step back, look at your values in your life, the things that really light you up, and then what activities could you find that fulfill those values that are going to really ignite you as a person and, and your wife. We often forget to check in on our core values, so I, I would that's a, the short version anyway. Anyway, sorry, over to Julia. Julia, before you say anything on this, we've got a question. <laughs> You're not allowed to speak, Julia. No. <laughs> We've got a question on Facebook that is very similar in many ways to what Justin's just been asking about, and it's from a lady called Jen. How does everyone deal with triggers in the early days around socialisation? I have zero sober friends, find, it, um, find I have to really defend myself when out with friends. It's why I'm not drinking. People don't seem to get it and put a lot of pressure on me to drink. So if you can kind of talk around that, that'd be great. Of course, yeah. So, and um, it's interesting. I was smiling when Simon was talking because two of the earlier chapters in my book are one of them is called Connection, and one of them is called What Do You Love to Do, or something along those lines. What makes you come alive? I think it is actually. And um, so, um, I think it's it's really really fundamental. But in terms of connection, I often go back to the Johan Hari quote that the opposite of addiction is connection. And um, I think that now is actually kind of, in a way, it's a good time to be forging those sober connections because they are, unless you are somebody who, who resonates with AA or smart recovery and wants to do something along those lines, the way to make sober connections is online. It's what I did. It's, what it's I think it's what all of us here did. And um, it, that's how you kind of link up with other sober people. And that was really my absolute saving grace in the early days. That was what got me sober was connecting with other sober people and um and also going back to what simon said um i think that for me the thing that sprang to mind was um was choir i joined a choir and again it was something that was completely different it was a new thing for me it was nothing at all to do with drinking and um again it was about going back to those absolute those principles of what makes me light up what makes what makes me feel alive what I what you know what I actually get genuine joy from and starting to do more of those things where drink wasn't even an issue I've naturally met people where drink hasn't been part of the friendship from the word go because we've got this other thing linking us together and it's the same with yoga it's the same with everything that I do in my life that um that we have the we have a connection that's that has nothing to do 
with alcohol. And I think that's as well is how you find the fun as well, going back to what Justin was saying, that if you think about what you love to do, what really lights you up with happiness, then find things somewhere where you can do that with other people. I think that's the two things. It's the doing the thing that makes you feel good without the need for any alcohol and doing it with other people. And I think even if it is like choir, for example, it took me a while to get to know my choir friends because we were kind of, you know, we go there and we sing next to each other and then we go home again. And it's the same in an exercise class. But even even before you get to the point of getting to know people, which can take longer when you're not drinking because you don't have that initial laugh, laugh, you know, that, that lowered inhibitions, that initial kind of, that, you know, that, that sort of, um, what I'm trying to say, that ability to just kind of, talk to people like you might do when you've had a drink it can take longer to get to know people as a sober person but when you forge those connections they're really real and in the meantime just doing things alongside other people gives you that feeling although obviously that is difficult at the moment and again that kind of going back to you know pe people who are begin in their kind of first year certainly of sobriety at the moment it's it's a big challenge and definitely give yourselves a break because it's it's such a massive thing just to be getting through this pandemic with sanity intact for all of us and to add early sobriety on top of that just every day that you get through not drinking you're doing amazingly absolutely amazingly and linking up with other people online who are going through the same thing is really key i think definitely i hope that's answered the question i feel like yeah, it has been We've actually got three hands up. Are the panel okay to answer questions uh, and our guests to stay on and answer these three questions before we leave? Yep. Uh, yeah. Questions. So we'll start with yeah. John O'Gorman. Um, John, hello, John. How are you doing now? You all right? Good, thank Hi, you. John. Can you ask your question, please, John? Yeah, it wasn't really a question as such. It was just, you know, I think I went through exactly what you were discussing about um, those feelings of, you know, I was always into the party scene. Um, and it was drink drugs, it was clubs, it was raving, it was it was everything. And, you know, my friends weren't really the problem. You know, they they all got careers, got married, had kids. I never, for whatever reason, I never wanted any of that. Um, and, and I just kept on partying until, you know, it wasn't cool to be partying in the late 30s anymore. Do you know what I mean? Um, my friends were getting younger and younger. Um, I did go the 12-step route. Um, and that for me has created a new social network for me. Um, and then from there, it's given me a springboard to, you know, try other things, walking groups. Um, there's plenty of sober festivals around now. There's one called Butterfields that's on every year. So I'm just trying to get some kind of sober fest off the ground. You know, I think we're, I think it's kind of becoming cool to be sober. You know, yeah. Is, Oh, yeah. <laughs> all these notes here, like, yeah. Like, Not kind of. <laughs> Not kind of cold. It's just it is cold with a one percent. I think I, I think we can rock it. You know, I really do. I think yeah. We can, uh, I'm, I'm two and a half years now into into Amazing. Um, and my life's completely changed. But but I've completely changed, and what's up here has completely changed. I don't recognise the person I was really the way. You know, I was quite cynical about everything. Um, I would have been cynical about doing this to be honest. You know, how is <laughs> how is talking about it going to actually stop me? Going home and, and, and or going to the pub, etc., um, or taking drugs, but you know what it does actually. Um, if you stick with it, and I think someone said before, you know, when you face challenges, I faced some challenges last year, you know, uh, a split up of a, a relationship, and uh, that went, you know, it went a bit dark and thought, right? it went away for me, and um, you know, um, and when you get through that, I'm kind of glad I went through those challenges now because once you do get through them. You're actually stronger for it, and, and I'm only speaking for myself, but I'm sure that people will identify with that. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of cool things for people to like to do out there. You know, I mean, for me, as I say, I want 12 step. That's not for everyone. Um, you know, I take out of the 12 step meetings what I need to take out, and I try and put something back. You know, helping other people. So, um, I don't know. I hope that maybe helps someone or somebody identifies with that. So, sorry, I was late. I'm helping. <laughs> oh, thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Siobhan, I'm unmuting you. Um, um, hi. Hi. <laughs> Mine isn't a question. It's um, similar to what um, John said, really. One of the words that um, I really heard Justin say was serious. And yeah. that he feels that life is serious. And um, it's just really similar to what everybody else has said. 
with meeting up with sober people. Whenever I meet up with my sober friends, we are always the loudest people wherever we are. We're always laughing the hardest, like being the most outrageous. Like at the minute, it's really hard to establish like these kind of connections and stuff, like everyone said. But your life is not going to be serious because of sobriety. I know like loads of other things are happening right now for you that are really, really hard. But serious is not the word that is associated with sobriety. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. Thanks, if you, Thank you. And if you look in the dictionary, the definition of sober is it actually says serious. So we should have a t shirt taking the serious out of sober because it's absolute <laughs> bullshit. And that's your job, Simon. It totally is. Um, so, last question. We've got one here, and I'm going to go around everybody because I want to make sure that everybody on the panel just gets a chance to ask you this. It's only a quick one. Um, how many times did you guys try to moderate before you finally realised giving up fully is, is what is needed? And that's from um, Fiona Riley. Um, we'll start with you, Lisa. How many times did you try to moderate? Lords. Well, I try. I kept telling myself every weekend, right, I'm just going to go out and have, like, two drinks tonight. And then, again, I'd come home at five in the morning after dancing on somebody's kitchen table I didn't know about. And then every weekend that kept happening. So, yeah, quite a long time, really, before I decided that's it. And it was the best decision ever. I tried to moderate from the day I started drinking, Namaste, and failed from the day I started drinking up until the day I finished. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay i think i'm the same i think i'm the same i remember somebody like you know when you get caught off guard of like how you know what why aren't you drinking tonight in those early days and someone caught me off guard and i just went well i've been drinking since 1986 and i needed a night off <laughs> 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 and i was like Actually, that's the truth. So yeah, like forever, forever. But I suppose in in earnest for a good decade before I actually stopped, like ten years. So I drank for well over twenty years. Wine every single day, one to three bottles, beer on top. The last five of those years, I was in a place where I had the internal conflict. Half of me wanted to stop, half of me didn't, and. That was when I started trying the oh, only drink at the weekends. Oh, there was a period where I was watering my wine down. I was putting 20% water, 80% wine, then it'd go to 30, 40, 50. Uh, you know, low alcohol wine mixed with normal wine, all these things. And I mean, I could, I lost count of how many times I tried to moderate, but for me, it absolutely didn't work. It was just part of the journey to discovering that I want the life for me was alcohol free. Thanks, Simon. William? Um, yeah, I'm a bit strange, really. I think I never tried to moderate. Um, for me, the whole point of drinking was to get drunk and to drink a lot. Um, and having one or two, I was just never, ever interested in. So I, honestly, I don't think I ever really attempted to drink one or two drinks. I just went from extreme binge drinking to stopping. But to be fair, I, I was never a regular drinker. I was always a binge drinker. So... I didn't try and moderate. I just went from drinking to stopping. You'd have your fill, I reckon, though, William. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sober Dave. Sober Dave. Uh, well, I was drinking a litre of coffee a night at uh, my finest time. But um, I, well, when I got married, um, obviously I had to try and moderate to three bottles of wine a night. And uh, I said, look, I'm going to moderate down to one bottle, which is enough anyway. And that lasted about two days because then I used to hide it because I realized one bottle just gave me the taste. So I used to hide a bottle of wine in, in the bedroom by the shower. And I used to have all the miniatures tucked in my coat pockets and whatever. So that's really it was it was two nights. So I, I realized that moderation wasn't the way to go. And a week later, I gave up. Thanks, Dave. And then over to our lovely guests, and just before you answer, I'd like to say thank you to both of you for making this special and for joining us. We really appreciate your time. All of us in this Sober Saturday panel really do appreciate both of you coming on, so thank you. Um, Claire. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for, for inviting me, guys. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, to ask, answer the question, I mean, like uh, like you guys said, it. I did it, I tried to moderate for years, probably about 10 years. 
Um, Because I never wanted to give up altogether. I just wanted to drink normally as I saw it. And and I set myself endless rules and I tried everything. I tried the, I won't drink at home. I'll only drink when I go out. I tried the, um, I'm only going to drink beer because I don't really like beer. I'm not going to drink wine or spirit. Um, And then I tried every other glass is water. And, you know, I mean, I, I set all these little sort of parameters trying to, keep control of it and they would only ever last for about a week and then I'd go back to normal so um so it was yeah it was a pretty ongoing process for about 10 years thank you so much Claire and last but certainly not least Julia um oh lord countless countless times um I think that um kind of similar to what people have said I think I always felt uneasy about my complete lack of an off switch and um, as my drinking progressed that would lead to me having um, blackouts and that's when it really started to worry me so I suppose that was probably kind of late 20s so that was over a decade that I was kind of constantly in that push pull of like sometimes just thinking oh it's fine it's fine you're not an alcoholic just go for it and then wanting to pull it back in and drink normally but um, as William said, I was never interested in being the kind of the sociable moderate drinker. My my drinking was to get drunk. I was a binge drinker. And um, I think what I always struggled with was that I felt like I should be able to control it. I felt like there was something wrong with me because I couldn't naturally rein myself in. And I think the thing that the shift for me that enabled me to, to stop drinking completely and to stay sober was realizing that although I don't have an off switch and I have no way of fixing my off switch that's just a natural consequence of what alcohol does to my body and that it doesn't mean there's something wrong with me it was nothing to be ashamed about and I think coming to that acceptance in no small part thanks to your book William and also on Grace's This Month in Mind uh, having that shift enabled me to kind of put the whole moderation thing to bed and to just say no that's not for me it's never going to work I can try at this forever and it was it's just never going to work and it's always going to get harder and and what it's it's just a downward slope for me unless I stop now and I did that two days after my 40th birthday and, and I haven't drunk since since never looked back basically and also yes thank you very much guys for having me on it's been brilliant I've loved it Oh, we've really enjoyed. Gavin, do you want to just tell people about next week? Hey, oh yeah, so we got our guest on Lee from Rock Sober. Uh, hoping his brother Sean can come on. I met these guys when I was four weeks into my sober journey, and uh, if you don't follow them on Instagram, they're seriously brilliant, aren't they? They're, they're just fantastic. They're brothers, and they've been uh, sober for five years now. So they're on next week. That'd be fantastic. Oh, thanks for that. Thanks for starting that out, Dave. So we're all going to get going now. We have run over. Sorry, I want to make sure that we answered the question. You, um, For people who are on Facebook, you can join the Zoom. It's at the top of the group in the announcements next week. And for people on Zoom, you can join the Facebook. Um, you just search Sober Saturday private group and you can find it all on Instagram. And we'll put some links under the description how you can find our guests and what they've done. So I hope that's been of use to you all. Um, I'm not going to unmute you all, but if you give us a wave <laughs> and we'll see you all next week. <laughs> Sorry, Alex, we let you do the bye and it's your worst bit. <laughs> 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 I hate it. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, right, we're going to go <laughs> <laughs> I hate doing the bye. I'm useless at it. <laughs> I'm just like, like, we're done now. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, thanks, guys.